Good morning and welcome to Sharper Iron. Spend the next hour with us studying the living and active Word of God, His two-edged sword of law and gospel, recorded for you in Holy Scripture, all about Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, and ascended for you. Thanks for tuning in this morning here on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. I'm your host, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Sharper Iron is underwritten by the Lutheran Church Extension Fund, where your investments help support the work of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Visit lcef.org for more information. On this Friday, September 18th, we are studying Proverbs chapter 14, verses 1 through 35. The way of wisdom and the way of folly lead entirely different directions. Solomon continues to shine a light on the way of wisdom that we who fear the Lord would walk in it. To help us sharpen our faith in Christ as we study God's Word today, we have with us regular guest, Pastor Dustin Beck. Pastor Beck serves at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas. Pastor Beck, welcome back to Sharp Iron. Good morning, Pastor Apple. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing well. Thanks for coming over here to Smithville today to record. I think you were here to introduce the book of Proverbs. I believe to so. Us. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a couple of weeks back. Yeah. So so we've gone a little ways right. since then, since chapter one. We're in the middle of a section of Proverbs. That lots and lots of proverbs. Yeah. What uh what do we need to know going into this particular section? Maybe a bit different from the last time you were here. Sure. So last time that I was here, we got a chance to sort of introduce the book and the the genre of a proverb. Um, and wisdom literature uh, as, as, a, as a whole substance. Uh, but now we're right in the middle of the, the content of Proverbs. And, and so this is, uh, you know, uh, we were talking right before we came on, on the air, and this is the part of Proverbs that you might see verses, just a single verse or two verses uh, on one of those calendars where you tear off each day there's a new Bible verse. Um, you know, these are some of the, uh, the great one-liners of the Bible where you could take any one of these Proverbs, and, and really and truly, you could take it out of context. That's something that's usually dangerous to do with the Bible. Uh, but a lot of these Proverbs just sort of stand on their own um, as a little brief statement, a brief proverb, there you go, um, that sort of uh, it encapsulates the wisdom that Solomon uh, is wishing to impart to his readers. Uh, remember that in the larger context of the book, uh, the idea here is about um, the fear of the Lord. That is, faith in God is what produces true wisdom. Uh, but that wisdom isn't just sort of a, could I call it a generic wisdom? Um, it's actually a very specific type of wisdom that actually has specific um, practical implications uh, such that, um, you know, uh, other people can see in you when you have the right kind of wisdom, when you have this fear of the Lord that produces wisdom and knowledge and truth and understanding. Uh, and so uh, a lot of these sound very, um, maybe we could say legalistic, mm. right? Um, or very works-based. And I don't think that's something that we need to dismiss or uh, something that we need to put aside and say, well, this just sounds like a bunch of law. I mean, in, in a way it kind of is, but, you know... Um, Right now, um, I'm I'm teaching a New Testament class to a bunch of uh, freshmen and high school uh, and sophomores in a, in a high school class, and uh, each morning we're beginning with a brief devotion, and uh, we're going through Psalm 119, you know, a handful of verses at a time, and that entire huge Psalm, the longest chapter in the Bible, um, second only to, uh, or, or I guess this chapter that I'm studying that we're studying today is like <laughs> the second longest. It feels like, anyways, right? 35 verses, Pastor Apple, good grief. Um, but Psalm 119 is all about God's law, his Torah, his instruction, right? Um, all about uh, the word of God, the fact that he has given us these things to walk in, um, and that as we walk in these things, other people see that light in us. They, they see the... Um, they see the gospel shining forth, uh, the love of God through the way that we live our lives. And so this is a little picture of that, a little snippet of that. And uh, like you said before we got on the air today, um, that's a, this is a lot of verses, so we're not going to be able to cover all of them together. But that's okay. Uh, I think we can still do, uh, do this chapter justice. Um, and if there's anything that you want to pick out that I didn't uh, highlight in my notes to you, let's, we can jump right into whatever you'd like. Sure. Well, just a, a few thoughts. Yeah. One, you know, it sounds legalistic. It is, there is law in the book of Proverbs. That's not a bad thing, though, is it? No, the law of God is good and right. Yeah. We're in yeah. favor of it. Yes, yes. So it's not something to be feared, but it is to recognize what it is, that it is how we should live. Right. That, and that's not a bad thing. In terms of the, the lack of context of some of these verses, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the, 
the words, the fear of the Lord, because that does help tie these things together. So that, I mean, for example, I, I, I thought about for today, maybe I would just do that old trick where you open to Psalm 14, not Psalm, Proverbs 14, mm. and I point to a verse, and that's the one we talk about. I love it. Right? That, that might not be, that's generally not the way to go through the scriptures. Oh, we could do that in Proverbs 14. But you think we could do it in Proverbs 14? Maybe. Maybe, maybe. There is there is context, though. Yeah. And and the fear of the Lord is a big part of it. We're going to see some of the larger themes that have been brought out, especially in those first nine chapters, the difference between wisdom and folly, the importance of instruction and receiving it with love. Those themes do help tie these verses together so that it's still maybe not the exact way to look at the book of Proverbs by just pointing to a verse and thinking only about that. But if you understand the entire context of the book, I think that you can just do that. So you can just look at an individual verse and you can understand uh, anytime that it says, like, for instance, I just looked at a random verse, fools mock at the guilt offering, but the upright enjoy acceptance, right? Verse nine. Uh, so, I mean, when you look at that, you already understand that there's a contrast between the foolish one and the upright. And so the upright is going to be the one who has this fear of the Lord um, that produces wisdom and knowledge. And the fool is the one who rejects the yeah. fear of the Lord. Okay. Right. So, I mean, you do have uh, kind of some, maybe we could just call them um, uh, hermeneutical tools, that sounded fancy when I said it, right? right. You, you have some kind of a, um, you've got this, uh, uh, maybe a decoder ring. Maybe mm-hmm. we've got the, some listeners that had decoder rings from cereal boxes and things like that. Right? Do you know what that is, Pastor I, Apple? I do. Do okay. they still put those in cereal boxes? I don't know. I don't Not know the either. cereal that I eat. Me neither. Yeah. But that's another topic for another day. Um, yeah, so you have kind of this understanding, this um, decoder ring, this... Um, this way of viewing the book of Proverbs, that it is a contrast between wisdom, which is rooted and uh, finds its, its, uh, its meaning in the knowledge of the Lord and his, his gospel love. Um, and then you have those who are going to go their own way. Um, and ultimately, we find that the way of the world, the way of the individual, the way of yourself um, is what we call foolishness. Mm. So with that, let's read. And okay. like you said, this is a long chapter. I think I think you win the prize in the study of Proverbs for getting the longest chapter. So I'm going to read about half of it to get us started, and we'll look at the other half on the other side of the break. Sounds good. Proverbs 14, beginning at verse 1. The wisest of wisdom builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. By the mouth of a fool comes a rod for his back, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. Where there are no oxen, the manger is clean, but abundant crops come by the strength of the ox. The faithful witness does not lie, but a false witness breathes out lies. A scoffer seeks wisdom in vain, but knowledge is easy for a man of understanding. Leave the presence of a fool, for there you do not meet words of knowledge. The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. Fools mock at the guilt offering, but the upright enjoy acceptance. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. Even in laughter the heart may ache, and the end of joy may be grief. The backslider in heart will be filled with the fruit of his ways, and a good man will be filled with the fruit of his ways. The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. One who is wise is cautious and turns away from evil, but a fool is reckless and careless. A man of quick temper acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. That was verse 18 that we stopped with there, Proverbs 14, verses 1 through 18. So we won't just point at a particular verse, but we'll just start with the first one there and yeah. see how the conversation leads us. Sure enough. The wisest of wisdom builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. Take us into that one. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, uh, again, this contrast between wisdom and between folly. We're going to see this over and over again. Um, and, and it says that, you know, according to wisdom, 
which we understand to be the wisdom of fearing and loving and trusting in God above all things, um, you know, by our wisdom, we are able to establish, to build, and to maintain things. Um, and this is talking about a house, a household. This is talking about a family can be built by this. Uh, but you can use your very own same hands that could build something by wisdom, and you can utterly destroy it, right? Uh, this happens, um, uh, we, we see this happen all the time. Uh, when people try to take matters into their own hands, when people uh, think that they're better off apart from God, when people think that they can, um, they can do it their own way and they can, they can get by just fine. Uh, you know, people, uh, unfortunately, we see them fall away from the church uh, many times. And it's, it's one of those things that um, I don't know if Dr. Phil ever actually asks, how's that working out for you? Um, I don't watch Dr. Phil. Who? I don't know. Exactly. Uh, but it's one of those things where it, it winds up many times you can look at, you know, a, a family's situation. You can see that they've they've fallen away from uh, from the faith. They've fallen away from the community of the church and they just don't have anybody to fall back on. They don't have any any kind of a support system built in. And so their foundation begins to crumble. Uh, and we again, we were talking about this before we came on the air. I feel like we talked for two or three hours before we came on the air today, right? Um, we were talking about uh, just the fact that, you know, somebody who's separated and isolated from the church, they have no frame of reference for forgiveness. Mm. And my goodness, you try to try to establish, try to build up a house or a household uh, without any forgiveness, um, and it's uh, it, it might be the strongest uh, house that imaginable, but it's going to be brittle. It is going to, you know, crumble the first time that, that a wave hits it, the first time that, um, that you know, a, a pandemic hits uh, or the first time that, that something out of the ordinary, unexpected happens. And we both know that life happens, right? And so if you've built up your house with foolishness, with folly, if you built it up according to your own wisdom, um, that really is no wisdom, right? And so there's, there's, a, there's a consequence, there's a penalty uh, to be paid, Um and that's, I, I think that's what verse 1 is really getting at the heart of, uh, is that godly wisdom will establish a house and a family, right? Uh, but with the very same hands that godly wisdom can build those things up, um, human foolishness uh, can tear it down just as easily. Psalm 127 comes to mind, mm -hmm. which begins, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Right. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain, which I think that, that helps with the context again of Proverbs. What, what is this wisdom? What does it mean to be the wisest of wisdom here? Wisest of women here in verse one, a wise family. What does that look like? It, it's more than good budgeting. I mean, yeah. <laughs> not that not that that's unimportant or or it, you know it's it's more than the the managing of the chores within the household or something like that. It it is the wisdom that comes from the Lord alone and the wisdom that you're pointing us to and I think rightly so is the wisdom of forgiveness. Well, thank you. Well, when I when I talk to particularly I emphasize this when I'm doing premarital counseling, yeah. the importance of forgiveness in sustaining the relationship between the husband and the wife. And, you know, Go just ahead. to piggyback off of that, I, I do the exact same thing. And, you know, that's the importance of being in church is because there's nowhere else that talks about forgiveness. The rest of the world is, you know, is eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. Right. The rest of the world is keeping score. And the rest of the world is, is gathering up, um, you know, that um, figurative ammunition to use in future arguments and future disagreements, um, whereas the church encourages us time and time again to, as you know, God has forgiven us of every sin ever, um, that we likewise ought to forgive our neighbors and even the neighbors that live under our own roof. Um, we ought to forgive them for their minuscule little tiny sins, comparatively speaking to our own. Right. So I mean, I, maybe this is maybe this verse is a little scary, right? Because it, it actually says that. You know, um, kind of we make our own bed that we have to sleep in. <laughs> and so we make it either by the wisdom and fear of the Lord um, or by the foolishness that says, no, thanks, God, I've got this under control. Hmm. Yeah. Well, in that sense, all of Proverbs can be pretty scary. It's a warning, yeah. Because because of exactly what you're saying, that there are consequences to the way that we live. When our lives match up with the law of God, they tend to go better. Right. When our lives don't, they tend not to go as well. Now, again, these are these are proverbs, not promises, <laughs> and so they're the fact that we are sinners means that 
things don't always go quite this way, but generally speaking, these things are true. And so it is, it, it is scary, which is why you do need to read Proverbs in the context of, for example, the matter of the forgiveness of sins, right. which is which is here in the book of Proverbs in places. It's not obviously as strong as you get it, say, in like Isaiah or in the Gospels or in Paul's epistles, but the matter of forgiveness is there. And, and reading that here is, I think, of great importance. How is it that we are able to forgive? It wasn't that long ago. It was just this last Sunday in the three-year lectionary where we heard from Matthew 18, that parable that Jesus teaches at the end concerning the servant who has forgiven a ridiculous amount of debt. The The technical term that, that we heard together in a, a sermon was zillions of dollars is how much he owes. I thought he said bajillions. It could have been that. That's another <laughs> technical term. I'm not sure the, the conversion rate between zillions and bajillions, but it's a lot. Right. That's how many sins he has forgiven. It is only from that sort of forgiveness that we've received from our Heavenly Father that we then can turn to our neighbor, even those neighbors under our same roof, and forgive them. That's the only place where that kind of wisdom is going to come from. Right. Absolutely. So let's jump to verse two. Okay. Sounds good. Whoever At walks. At this rate, we're going to be, uh, we'll, we'll we'll get be to done about, next week. Yeah. Sounds good. Good. I've, you know, that'll work for me. I got nowhere to be. Whoever walks in uprightness fears the Lord, but he who is devious in his ways despises him. Yeah. So, uh, this is um, sort of a summary of the you know the book of of Proverbs here. This is and it's good to return back to the main theme over and over and over and over and over again because it reminds us uh, what the main thesis statement is. Uh, the major point of the book of Proverbs is that the fear of the Lord um, is that's what the upright do. Uh, that's what how the upright live, right? Um, I'm sure that every single one of your guests has had opportunity uh, to talk about what fear of the Lord is, but for the sake of anybody who's listening today who hasn't been tuning in regularly, uh, just we can we can go out and say that when we talk about the fear of the Lord, um, I, I remember when I was in high school, uh, Tim, uh, Pastor Apple, when we were in high school, uh, I felt like there was a real effort to kind of downplay the fear of the Lord, right? Um, and so there was, and maybe it was going on before that, but I probably wasn't paying attention. I know you were. Uh, but there was a real effort to say, uh, when it says fear of the Lord, it really means respect for the Lord, right? Um, it's it's really all about, um, you know, kind of having a holy fear kind of a deal, which is not, it's, you should never be afraid of God, right? But I think when we introduced the book a few weeks ago, we talked about, you know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the fact that, hey, you know, in a, in a very real way, in a very raw way, we should be just a tiny bit afraid of God because he's almighty, and he is holy. And you know what? We are not almighty and holy. <laughs> and, and so if God is holy and he has expectations of his creation because he is the creator and he is holy and perfect and blameless and innocent and pure, I um, mean, he is almighty. Um, then what's to what's to stop him from, you know, um, you know, just ceasing to think us in in existence. Right. Um, and, and it's his great mercy and his great love for us. Uh, but I think that it is healthy, it is safe for us uh, to have a, a healthy fear of God uh, at his glory, at his majesty, at his power. Remember, when people run into God, um, you know, in the Bible, uh, what reaction do they generally have? They think they're about to die. They, yeah, they, they think that they are about to die. Isaiah in chapter 6, Woe is me, I am undone, I am uncreated, for I am a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips, right? Uh, John, in the book of Revelation, Jesus shows up and he's bright and shining like the sun, and John falls down, necros is the Greek word, um, he falls down as a dead man until Jesus comes over and touches his shoulder and lifts him up, right? This is the experience when you see God. And so there is a healthy fear. Now, we could also piggyback off of what Martin Luther says uh, in the small catechism of 1529. And we could say that when we talk about, um, about having a God, right? Um, you shall have no other gods, commandment number one. It's the number one commandment there, right? What does this mean? We should fear we should love, we should trust God above all things, above everything else, above every other power and principality, above every other relationship and family member and everything else that's in, in existence. God is the one who is feared but also trusted, and he's loved. Those three things go together is that there is a, um, there is a healthy fear, uh, but there is also this, this overwhelming, um, all-encompassing trust that says, man, even though, God, you could take it all away from me, um, 
you have promised that you won't. You have promised good things to me. I am your baptized child, right? And so for that reason, I love you. Okay? Mm-hmm. So that's that's kind of a little brief reminder or a, um, a, a first time for somebody who's maybe uh, just now tuning in. Uh, that's what we're talking about when we talk about whoever walks in the uprightness fears the Lord, right? We're not just talking about, wow, he's constantly afraid that God's going to send a lightning bolt down or something like that, right? Uh, but instead, the one who is devious, the one who is two-faced, the one who walks uh, according to um, you know, his own wisdom, trying to, uh, to pull a fast one on everybody and to try to, uh, to make, make a good way for himself, he despises God. Why does he despise God? Because God won't have it. God won't, won't settle for it. God won't allow you uh, to get ahead in this life, right? There, there's, a, there's recompense coming. What a fun word, recompense. The imagery here, I think, is, is worth considering. As, sure. you, as you brought up those various passages where someone comes face-to-face with God, and they, they usually fall over. There's usually something physical about right. their, their response. I mean, for example, John in the book of Revelation. Then when Jesus comes and touches him— he gets up. You get this uprightness yeah. so that the one who bows in humility, who recognizes that the Lord stands over him, he's the one who's actually upright, yeah. whereas the one who tries to walk upright on his own ends up falling and ends up being devious, walking various paths, not straight, not and upright. And maybe we could say not only is he two-faced, not only is he devious, not only is he sort of a hypocrite, but he's he's a facade, mm. right? And so to the world, the devious looks like he's got it figured out. It looks like he's got all the answers, uh, whereas the one who walks in uprightness fearing the Lord many times looks broken down, many times looks, you know, uh, like he doesn't have everything figured out. Uh, there's there's something to be said for humiliation and for humility mm-hmm. um, that, that says, um, Lord, uh, Jesus, save me. Mm. Yeah. Picking up on that same theme, I think, and looking at a proverb that is a bit different than something we've encountered so far, I'm going to jump us down to verse 10, I'll which also happens to be one that you did send a note on. Hey-o. The heart knows its own bitterness, and no stranger shares its joy. This one's not talking about fools and those who are wise. It's not talking about wickedness and righteousness. It It's more reflective on an individual person. Yeah. And this, this applies to everybody, right? Um, you know, the truth is, is that the person that you encounter in this life that knows each and every one of your struggles, each and every one of your failings, each and every one of your, um, well, your shortcomings, uh, is, is only the person that you see in the mirror, right? Your own heart knows how rotten you are to the core. And that's, you know, uh, that is an absolute function of the law, um, is that, you know, uh, the law of God, it, it instructs us. It's written on our hearts, and it tells us this is the way that things ought to be. This is the way that you ought to live life. This is the way that society ought to look. Um, and, I mean, my goodness, we are in a, a broken society time right now, right? Not to even comment on anything in specific. I think I can just let that one hang out in the air, right? We are in a time of profound brokenness, and we all recognize that because we have written in our hearts the way that things are supposed to be. And so our hearts understand this. And I think a lot of times we kind of project this onto others because we don't like to admit that I am the problem, that my sins um, are what has made society and the world um, and even my family uh, the way that it is. And so this is kind of, it's a, it's a splash of cold water, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the heart knows its own bitterness. No stranger shares it's joy. So, you know, when it says that no stranger shares its joy, um, you know, it's talking about the, the, again, we have a lot of this Hebrew poetry where you're going to have uh, a couplet where you'll have, you know, um, A is like this, but B is like that, right? And so we're going to switch over to the other side of it. No stranger shares its joy in, in a same way. You know, it's, it's hard to know um, the, uh, the joys, the, the great deep joys that we experience in this life. It's, it's difficult to put some of those into words. Right. I mean, the the joy uh, that, that, you know, you and I are able to have as parents. Right. Um, the joy that you and I are able to have, uh, you know, as 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 husbands to our wives, um, as, as pastors to our congregations. That's just something that it's difficult to put into words uh, because our our hearts don't really do a good job of explaining or of 
uh, of, of putting that out there um, in words that really, really get the job done, right? Um, so back to the first, the first little couplet here, the first section. Um, only your heart is going to know your own shame, right? Um, there are, are, are sins and griefs and sorrows um, that you will never share with another human person. And that's, I think that that's maybe a defense mechanism that sometimes we use, not to get into too much soft uh, science or anything like that. Uh, but we can find some consolation uh, in others. Uh, and and I, I think, again, back to the conversation about being in the church, about the conversation about having that community, right, that this is a good thing, right? But ultimately, uh, sin tries to isolate us. Sin tries to alienate us. Um, I think uh, in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together, he has a whole section where he talks about the fact that um, sin uh, sort of works to, um, to cut us off from our community. It'll tell us lies, like you're the only one that's ever done this thing or had this thought, or you know, none of them would love you or would accept you if they knew that you had said this thing or had, had, had done this thing in the, in the secret of your own heart, you know? And so sin tries to alienate us from Christ, but that's the, the love of Jesus is, is so perfect because he knows our pain. He has borne our griefs, right? Um, he, he, is, he is at one with us. We were just talking in confirmation last night about uh, the big theme of the great exchange, where Jesus takes all of our sorrows, all of our pains, all of our sin, and even its wages, death, right? Um, he takes all of that onto himself, and then he graciously gives to us his life, his, uh, his salvation, his forgiveness. He gives us his righteousness, right? And it's a beautiful thing to be able to talk about, you know, especially in this, uh, in this passage uh, when we just have this verse that kind of stands out. It sticks out like a sore thumb. The, heart's know, the heart knows its own bitterness, right? Wow, well, my heart feels bitter sometimes. Right. And strangers aren't able to share in the joy. But Jesus has become more to a stranger, uh, more than a stranger to us. He has become a brother to us. Right. So a Lord and a savior. Uh, And that's that's pure dripping gospel in here. You got to import it a little bit because it doesn't actually say that Jesus does this. But I think that's acceptable for today's conversation. Oh, for sure. For sure. Hebrews chapter two and chapter four, maybe both have this theme that we have a high priest who can sympathize with us in our weakness. He's been made like us in every way. So he isn't. A stranger, and and in fact, the heart that is his is the heart that he gives to us, so that he knows our bitterness, he shares our joys, he gives us his joys. You're listening to Sharper Iron here on KFUO. Going to take a short break. We'll be right back. Please stick around. In many ways, St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Bel Air, Maryland is just like any other Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod Church. They have worship services each Sunday and reach out to their community, but one thing they don't do is pay their electric bill. Hello, this is Rahema Kavuga, Synod Relations Manager of Lutheran Church Extension Fund. And if you want to hear what St. Matthew actually did to eliminate their electric bill, just visit interesttime.org. That's interesttime.org. Org. Welcome back to Sharper Iron. It is Friday, September 18th. We're studying Proverbs chapter 14, verses 1 through 35. We've got Pastor Dustin Beck with us. He serves at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas. If we miss a proverb today that you really wanted to know more about, give us a call at the listener comment line, 314-996-1542. Leave us a message or send an email to kfuo at kfuo.org. Let us know what proverb you wanted to know more about. I'll be recording some short bonus podcast material that will come out for you to sharpen your faith in Christ here in the Proverbs. Back to the text, Pastor Beck. We left off in verse 18, so I'm going to read now the rest of the text, verses 19 through 35 here in chapter 14. The evil bow down before the good, the wicked at the gates of the righteous. The poor is disliked even by his neighbor. But the rich has many friends. Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Do they not go astray who devise evil? Those who devise good meet steadfast love and faithfulness. In all toil there is profit, but mere talk tends only to poverty. The crown of the wise is their wealth, 
but the folly of fools brings folly. A truthful witness saves lives, but one who breathes out lies is deceitful. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life, that one may turn away from the snares of death. In a multitude of people is the glory of a king, but without people a prince is ruined. Whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. The wicked is overthrown through his evil doing, but the righteous finds refuge in his death. Wisdom rests in the heart of a man of understanding, but it makes itself known even in the midst of fools. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. A servant who deals wisely has the king's favor, but his wrath falls on one who acts shamefully. That is the rest of the text for the morning, Proverbs 19, sorry, 14, verses 19 through 35. So let's pick up right there at verse 19, Pastor Beck. The evil bow down before the good, the wicked at the gates of the righteous. Who are the evil and the wicked? Who are the good and the righteous? What's this verse saying? Just double checking. We've still got two hours left in the show. That's close. Okay, close. Okay, good. So, um, one of the one of the things that I, when I was reading through this text, uh, this whole chapter, and preparing for it, is um, most of the proverbs that you read um, are very uh, easy to be taken at face value, right? Uh, you read it. Um, and you say, okay, I think I know what this means. Um, but a few of them, uh, you almost have to ask the additional question, not is this true, but how is this true, right? How can we understand this? Uh, because we know that God's word is true. That's one of our uh, one of our presuppositions that we walk to the text with, right? Uh, but so how is it true that the evil bow down before the good and the wicked at the gates of the righteous? Uh, because that's not our experience all the time, right? That doesn't seem like a universal truth. That doesn't seem um, proverbial, Uh, as it were. Um, And so maybe the helpful thing to think here is um, not necessarily how is this true, but when is this true, right? So this is a a true statement in terms of uh, in the long run, over the course of maybe time or maybe at the end of time, right? We know for sure at the end of time, uh, we've we've got a very clear, well, a somewhat mostly very clear picture of the end um, and how everything is going to work out for all of those who have this this uh, wisdom of the fear and love of, of God. Uh, and so when we think in terms of uh, in the long run or uh, at the end t- times, uh, or as theologians like to say, when we think eschatologically, ooh, 50 cent word, um, uh, so our experience in this life is usually uh, not that evil bow down before the good uh, and the wicked sit at the gates of the righteous, but one day that will be abundantly true. One day that'll be absolutely the truth um, is that, um, you know, first of all, every knee is going to bow to Jesus and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. You know, he is the good, he is the righteous, um, and we who are found to be righteous in him uh, will be beside him. We will be right there bowing our knees in joyful adoration, right? And those uh, who are on the outside of the gates, those who are, um, who are you know, uh, uh, foolish, proverbially speaking, uh, they will be bowing their knees uh, to Jesus um, in, well, in, uh, in, in remorse and in great, uh, great pain. And they will be confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord, uh, not in joy and jubilation, but instead uh, that will be their own, um, uh, their own condemnation, their own, uh, you know, speaking out that, well, he, you know, he really was the son of God, right? And we had no idea. We, we rejected, uh, we rejected the Lord. We rejected his wisdom. Um, and so now we are, here we are at the gates of the righteous, uh, bowing down, uh, as the good and righteous one stands, uh, stands inside the city. Mm. I, I'm with you that this is definitely true eschatologically. That might even be it's worth a, a whole word. dollar. Maybe more than 50 cents. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a big word. But I I wonder, there's at least a few times in the scriptures where I think it's true temporally, too. One one that comes to mind is the account of Joseph in the book of Genesis. Joseph and his brothers, sure. Where where you have, I mean, Joseph even has the dream ahead of time. Right. And that is fulfilled there in Egypt. Perhaps in the life of King David, we could we could say right. similarly, where we see the evil bowing down before the good. So it's it's not like... 
It's not like it never happens temporally. Right. It's but I would I would still say it's the exception, not the rule. Right. We don't. Uh, I don't think that our listeners uh, and anybody that reads the Book of Proverbs should expect in their life to have wicked people bowing down before them. Right. I mean, we don't we don't want to. Um, because we're trying to we're trying to apply proverbs. We're trying to read proverbs, of course, in its original context. But the whole point of a proverb is that it's it's supposed to be timeless. It's right. supposed to be universal. And so we don't want to get into the uh, the fallacy where we say, you know, if if you're not living, what is what's the phrase they use? Like a victorious life. Right. You know, if you're not really winning at life, well, then you must clearly, you know, be in this this evil or this wicked category. If you're, you know, if you're being put upon, if you're, you know being made to bow down to other people. If you're if you're not the guy that has other people bowing down to you, you're obviously doing something wrong. I don't think that's necessarily what it's saying. And you're completely right. Uh, we do see there are instances, there are times uh, when, you know, when the good guys win. There are times uh, when when we see, but I would, I would submit um, that, I mean, even Joseph and David, the examples that you gave, even those are, uh, are to be understood as, um, sort of types mm-hmm. of the ultimate, you know, um, the ultimate enthronement, the ultimate exaltation of Jesus, right? And so when we see Joseph's brothers, you know, the the um, the sons of of Israel bowing down to him, right? This is this beautiful picture of the fact that uh, one day there will be a a, a child of Israel uh, who will be raised up, and he'll actually sit at the right hand of Almighty God Himself, um, and then all nations will bow down to him. So I don't want to lose lose sight of that. Uh, you're absolutely right. There are some days uh, when this is more evident for us. Yeah, that the the evil bow down to the good, and the wicked at the gates of the righteous. Uh, but also, you know, never forget that in our daily experience. Um, we're going to experience bad and good. We're going to experience, you know, blessings around us and people who wish to curse us. And so there's um, just have a little hope, have a little, you know, have a little faith that in the long run, this is this is true. It'll prove to be true. Right. And I, I think that's where a verse like this is important in those moments where we don't see it right. so that we would believe what the word says, as, as I've heard others say that we would we would see with our ears. Right. And and so when I don't see in this life the evil bowing down before the good, that that would not then tempt me toward the evil or toward wickedness to think that I could somehow get that sort of bowing down right now, rather hold on to the truth that I know is going to be fulfilled at the coming of Christ and in the resurrection. I mean, I, I think you're exactly right that the resurrection here is the backbone of this verse, and I, I think of many verses in the book of Proverbs, that where is it most true or completely true, it is there in the resurrection. And certainly this would be an example of that. Right. And I mean, maybe, you know, just as, as kind of an offshoot of that, um, another idea that, you know, goes into Christian or biblical wisdom um, is never forgetting the fact, and I think that our world uh, today has really forgotten the fact, um, that death is an enemy, right? Right. Um, death is not a release. Death is not, um, you know, something that we should you know, look forward to or we should, you know, celebrate, things like that. Death really is an enemy, and so that's why the resurrection is so important is because, um, you know, we are a people, uh, we don't fear death, right? We fear the Lord who even has power over death, right? And so, you know, there's a day coming when each and every Christian will will hear the the voice of our shepherd calling us from the grave and saying, Hey, we're done with death now. It's it's time has passed, right? And then even death will bow the knee. Even death will be subjugated under Christ and under uh, all who are in Christ. So maybe that's a, a helpful thing for us to remember and to never forget um, is that true wisdom, the wisdom that uh, that knows and fears the Lord. True wisdom is a wisdom that is looking beyond death. It's a wisdom that understands that Christ is risen and His resurrection is um, that is the hinge on which everything else that we ever read from scripture or anything else that we ever do in our life or in the world to come, um, everything hinges on the fact that Christ isn't dead anymore. And so all who are in him will also one day not be dead anymore. Yeah. Verses 20 and 21, I think go together. 
Mm -hmm. The poor is disliked even by his neighbor, but the rich has many friends, which is, yeah, that's true, but I'm not sure if that's good or not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think verse 21 helps as to, how, okay, well, that's the general truth. And well, how, how do I take that as a Christian? Whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner, but blessed is he who is generous to the poor. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, it is very dangerous to take these two verses by themselves because if you just pull 20 out of any kind of context, you just say, oh, well, I mean, it's it's okay to not like poor people, right? And if I want to make friends, I got to make money, right? Which is not the point. It is the absolute opposite point. So this is a, a double couplet. This is two verses that are to be taken together. And we get the idea, um, the poor is disliked by his neighbor, but he shouldn't be. He should be loved by his neighbor. Right. And the rich has many friends. Uh, but, you know, um, are, are they really friends or are they just there because, hey, he's you know, he's he's rich. He's got a lot of, of things that he can share. And so the further clarification there in verse 21, whoever despises his neighbor is a sinner. So um, if you don't like uh, your neighbor on account of his poverty on our, or on account of yeah, his wealth. Right. Uh, if you don't like your neighbor, uh, you're doing it wrong. Right. Rather, blessed uh, is the one who is generous to the poor. So blessed is the one who um, who out of his own wealth, out of his own livelihood um, is a blessing to others. I mean, this is these two verses in tandem uh, are a great reminder to Christians of uh, why we are generous and why we are loving. Right. The two go tandem. The two go hand in hand. You can't have uh, one without the other. At least you shouldn't. And James in his epistle brings up the matter of distinctions between right. the rich and the poor in the church. So, I mean, verse 20 there, if you've, if you've read the book of James, which we did here on Sharper Iron, right. you should recognize that this is not the attitude of, of Christians toward rich and poor, that we would not show favoritism toward the rich, but instead be generous to the poor. And and I'm, I, so I, I think, yeah, th that's one of those examples where you've got to be careful about pointing to verse 20 and, and ripping it out of its context. Let's jump down to verse 26 and 27. We get the fear of the Lord coming back. And and maybe this is, this is, these are easier verses for us to talk about as Lutheran pastors, maybe. But, but I think they're important ones so that we don't lose sight of that. So verse 26 and 27, in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence and his children will have a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may turn away from the snares of death. We get... It, Again, it's, it's wonderful how Proverbs just weaves these things together, both the things temporal and the things eternal. They, they go hand in hand in the divine wisdom that our Lord has for us. Right, and it's, it's, it's really fascinating to me because, you know, it seemed like we had gotten, um, we had gotten in incredibly practical for a minute. We were talking about, uh, we thought we were talking about how to make friends and influence people. We thought we were talking about, you know, um, uh, in toil there is profit, verse 23. So work hard because you will profit from it. But just talking tends only to poverty. So, you know, if you, if you work hard, you're going to do all right. If you just talk about working hard, you're not. Right. I mean, this is this is really practical advice. I mean, I, my goodness, I should teach my kids this kind of stuff. Right. Um, but then we get to verse 26 and 27. And it's like we're we're changing gears without pushing in the clutch. Like all of a sudden we're, we're going into a different gear and it's just it, it's as sudden as anything. Right. We were talking about witnesses saving lives and, uh, and 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 liars breathing out lies and being deceitful and everything. All of a sudden in the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence um, and I don't really have a good answer for why we have this abrupt change of subject, but all of a sudden, um, good King Solomon in his wisdom has decided to, uh, to lay down some, some true wisdom, some eternal wisdom. And so he lay, he lays it down for us, uh, that we can have strong confidence, uh, who fear the Lord. Right. Um, and then his children will have a refuge talks about the fact that, um, you know, uh, pastor Apple, like myself, I know that, uh, you know, your chief mission in life is to raise up God-fearing children. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, we've just gotten confirmation started again. And, um, you know, in confirmation class, um, you know, I've, I've been talking with, uh, with my confirmants and saying, you know, listen, my goal right here as your pastor um, is to, to continue to plant seeds that have been planted all the way back from your baptism and from when your, your parents used to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Um, I'm continuing to plant those seeds and to water those seeds so that God might grant growth. 
right? And maybe that growth is during confirmation class so that you, uh, you know, you grow up and you, you never really walk away from how excited you are. I know kids are always excited to be in confirmation class. That's just a fact of life. But, you know, um, maybe it's something that doesn't sprout for a year or two. You and I both know that, unfortunately, sometimes kids kind of graduate from confirmation. They, they think that they or their parents think that they've graduated from church for a little bit. Right. Uh, but, you know, maybe during high school, they they kind of it flourishes. You know, and you've seen this like I have. It, it kind of hits them. Right. Their eyes open up and all of a sudden church is, is important. And it's not just something that they're doing for confirmation grade. It's not just something they're doing because mom and dad brought them. Right. Maybe it happens in college or maybe it happens when they become parents. But this is our sincere hope for our own children, uh, for our, uh, the children of our congregations, for for everybody who's listening, for for your children. Our hope is that um, the faith that uh, has been handed down to us through the scriptures and through faithful preachers would also be handed down to our children because uh, that's the whole point of faith is that it would be handed down to the next generation. Uh, the next generation will be taught to fear the Lord. The next generation will be taught um, the knowledge of the Lord. Um, and so Solomon just, uh, he reminds us here that we can have strong confidence in the midst of all of this other practical advice and everything else. Um, we ought to be confident people, not confident that we've got it all of our life figured out or confident that we've figured out how to make friends and influence people or to figure out wealth or profit or gain or anything like that, but that we've got eternity figured out. And, you know, I got to say, if you've got eternity figured out, you're doing okay. Here, everything else is going to be okay. If, if forever has taken, you know, if, if forever has been taken care of, everything else will kind of take care of itself. I think Jesus said something like that, seek first the kingdom of God, right, and his righteousness, and everything else will take care of itself. Well, everything else will be added unto you. Right, right. right. Yeah, I, the words, you know, his children will have a refuge. Yeah. I think all, all of the things that you, you're talking about, what comes before this verse, and this right. is true in chapter 14, it's true throughout the book of Proverbs. I mean, for example, 25, verse 25. Yeah. Truth that is that is a refuge for our children. We we want our children to have a quote. I'm going to do this in air quotes. A better life than we had. We yeah. want our children to learn from our mistakes. So where we were less than truthful, we teach them to be truthful as a refuge to them. Where we spent too much time talking and not a time, enough time working, we give that to them so that they have that as a refuge. But but all of that as a refuge doesn't end up mattering if you don't have this eternal refuge that is yours in the fear of the Lord, right? right. Jesus, how, how does he put it? What what good is it for a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his life, right? right. The, that eternal refuge. And that's, you know, why does Solomon put it here? Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know. I mean, like you said, sometimes it, it is seems very random. He's inspired. He is. By and, the Holy Spirit. And so I think the Holy Spirit would have us keep this in our minds, that it does show up periodically in the book of Proverbs, sometimes more strongly, as in a verse like this, sometimes a little more subtly, like we were talking about in verse 19, where you have to import the rest of Scripture to, right. to see it. But it's it's always there in the background as the foundation for this book, so that we never lose that eternal refuge that our Lord would give us through his Son. And I would just add one thing. Uh, you went to verse 25, a truthful witness saves lives, uh, the subject of truth. I think I've shared this with you on the program before, but um, I, a, a year or so ago, it became really clear to me that another word for truth is just reality. Mm. We want our kids to live in the real world, right? We want our kids to see things as they truly are, not as somebody else tells them that they are, not as uh, somebody else wishes them to be, not as they wish them to be, but instead... We want them to live lives that are in the truth. And so the truth is the reality. Um, and I, th I think that's just such a helpful thing. It's anytime we talk about truth, remember that we're talking about reality and not lies. We're talking about the way that things actually are and not false things. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's just, that's one of those things that probably everybody, every one of the listeners already knew and had already, you know, deeply internalized. But when I, when I r realized that true is just another way of saying real, um, I think it probably blew my mind a little bit. And uh, so every time that I, I come across something like that or get a chance to talk about it, I just, I love saying true means real. Mm. A real witness saves lives. But one who breathes out lies is deceitful. He's empty. He's got nothing, right? Mm. So uh, that's verse 26. Should we talk about 27? 
Sure. Go cool. for it. I love 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life uh, that one may turn away from the snares of death. Yeah. Um, oh, goodness gracious. This is this is so wonderful. This is, um, you know, Jesus talking with the woman at the well um, that he's going to uh, give to her um, a, a well of, of living water that will never dry up. This is Revelation talking about the river of life um, that will give uh, give water uh, to the uh, to the tree of life, and it will produce its its fruit in every every season. Right. Um, this is that idea that uh, that when you fear God, um, you have life abundant. Right. Uh, the fountain of life. Uh, this this. You know, I get. I don't know if this is the same like fountain of youth type thing that you know explorers were looking for, you know, a couple hundred years ago or what. But this idea of a fountain that gives life um, is the idea that you know um, in the ancient world, especially in the in the Near East, you had uh, you had this. You know, there were a lot of deserts out there. There were a lot of places that if you could get separated from water, you know, you were kind of um, up a creek without a paddle. There was water if you were in a creek. Generally speaking. Although sometimes there are dry creeks. Up a dry creek yes. without a paddle or a boat. You were in the wilderness. So it's it's important that there is a fountain of life. There is a river of life um, that, that comes from what? It comes from the fear of the Lord. It comes from knowing God. You know God, um, you're never going to... You're never going to thirst. You're never going to, uh, to be parched. You're never going to, uh, to die uh, from... Um, from being thirsty. I don't know what you call that. It's not starving. I don't know either. There's a word for it, I'm sure. Probably so. Send us an email. Let us know what the word Sounds is. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yes. Um, but anyways, so that, uh, anyways, the fear of the Lord also exists not just so that we can have a fountain of life, but that we may turn away from the snares of death, right? Um, the, the, the pangs of Sheol that encompass us, uh, all of the, um, the bitterness and the, the hatred of this world, all of the bad stuff um, that really are snares and traps that really are set out for us uh, to drag us away from the knowledge of the Lord uh, and, and from the wisdom of the Lord. This is, this is kind of, we always say, you know, um, uh, the devil is kind of a one-trick pony. He has this way of, uh, he's got a trick and a trap, and it's always the same one. And he says, did God really say, right? Did God really say um, that he's going to give you eternal life uh, for fearing him, for trusting him, for loving him? Um, and he tries to set this snare out for us uh, just along our lives, along the path, every single, every single day and every single place that we step. And so this is why it is so abundantly important for us uh, to maintain and to remain in that fear of the Lord um, all of our days. Now, do we do this perfectly? No, of course not. Never. Right. But the, the idea here is that Proverbs serve as a reminder for us. Uh, go back to fearing the Lord. Right. Have, have you feared the Lord lately? Are, are you um, are, are you in a place right now where you fear God's command, his law, his word, uh, where you trust his gospel? Or are you saying, you know what, I think I do a pretty good job of gospeling myself. I think I do a pretty good job of, of, of coming up with the way that I ought to live my life myself. That's deeply impactful. That's, that's, it's convicting, right? Uh, but it's also comforting because God, is, he makes a much better God and Savior than I do. Yes, he does. That's the first commandment right there. Right. Pastor Beck, we got about two minutes here. Okay. So I'm not sure that's enough time to really talk about another proverb. Ooh, yeah, there's some Let's good ones. <laughs> take, as you reflect on everything we've talked about, which is right. a, a wide variety, and we know all of Scripture points us to Jesus. Right. How does Proverbs 14 point us to Jesus? Proverbs 14 points us to Jesus because it reminds us that we are called to be people of wisdom, right? And wisdom is going to look different in different um uh, in different venues and different avenues of our life, right? So we are called, at times, we are called to be wisdom in terms of our, uh, let's say, frugality or in terms of our the way that we manage our household, yeah, the way that we actually build our house and our, uh, our, our household, our family, right? There are times when wisdom is going to look like understanding what's going on in your own heart, right? My goodness, wow, when you look at that person in the mirror, um, being able to actually understand uh, the heartache that you experience and everything else. Uh, we didn't even talk about scoffers seeking wisdom in vain uh, back in verse 6, but knowledge is easy for a man of understanding, right? Um, wisdom looks different in different, uh, different facets 
of our lives. But the important thing to remember is that um, while we're in this constant rubber meets the road, practical living out our lives, uh, the important thing to always take with us, the important thing to never forsake um, is that fear, love, and trust of God. Um, it goes with us and it informs everything that we do. It teaches us to love our neighbors. It teaches us to diminish ourselves. It teaches us to love uh, the unlovable and uh, to like we had, had such a great conversation to find that forgiveness and to find that that spirit of forgiveness whenever somebody sins against us. Um, so that's really uh, what chapter 14 is all about. It brings us back to the wisdom and the love and the fear of God, uh, which is found in Jesus Christ. Pastor Dustin Beck is the pastor at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Warda, Texas, helping us this morning with Proverbs chapter 14, verses 1 through 35. Pastor Beck, thanks for being our guest this morning. Absolutely, Pastor Apple. Thank you. I'm your host here on Sharper Iron, Pastor Timothy Apple of Grace Lutheran Church in Smithville, Texas. Thanks for spending the morning with us. Talk to you again next week.